Good Wednesday afternoon, too. Four o'clock time for Sports for CLE. The beginning of the new league year in the NFL. So all of the free agent goings on and trades we've been talking about the last couple of days can be made official as of now, four o'clock um, on Wednesday. We, special show lined up for you. Uh, a little later in the show, Lance Risen will join us. We'll take a film breakdown video analysis of Jerry Judy, what he brings to the offense. Going to talk plenty about the new coaching staff on the offensive side of the football, how motion might be included in this new made offense with Andy Dickerson, offensive line coach. We will also hear from some folks in Buffalo um, about Ken Dorsey, what his strengths are and what he might be bringing uh, to the table. Um, first, let's recap what's gone on in uh, in the Browns offseason. So these are the, the free agent and trade acquisitions that have gone on the last couple of days. Uh, Jerry Judy, he is in the final year of um, a, a rookie extension of his contract, 12.9 million. Jordan Hicks, two years, 8 million. Naheem Himes, one year, 3.5 million. Jameis Winston, one year up to and that's important, up to $8.7 million. Um, they also have added Hakeem Adeniji, um, a, a six-foot, four-inch, 315-pound tackle. Returning players, guys the Browns have re-signed. Zadarius Smith, the big one, two years, $23.5 million. They also get Maurice Hurst back, one year, $3.2 million. Shelby Harris back two years, nine million. They also re-sign uh, guard Michael Dunn uh, has had some production when he has been put in. Now, players that have left the Browns uh, via free agency, Anthony Walker, the linebacker going to the Dolphins, Sione Taki Taki, another linebacker going to the Patriots, Mike Ford, special teams ace, DB going to the Texans, and Jordan Elliott defensive tackle headed to the 49ers. Uh, let's welcome in Casey Kinneman from Dog Pound Daily and the Barking Browns podcast. Um, Casey, you look at these, just a quick overall reaction um, of the work that Andrew Berry and this front office has done to this point in free agency. Uh, efficiency is what comes to mind. You look at the five players they brought in, I think you got like 34 million wrapped up and five players and a free agency that is hard to do you know and if you look at those individually I don't think they overpaid for any one single player which is also very difficult to pull off in free agency you often find yourself overextended when you bring new players in but when you look at the players they re-signed they just solidified that defensive line you know there was a lot of question marks there mostly hinged around Zadarius but you know to be able to bring three of those four players back obviously you lose Elliott but you, to keep that intact, I think that is massive. So just the efficiency and to be able to keep the continuity on the defensive line, those are the things that stick out immediately. Yeah, that line was so good, um, it made it such a huge jump. Let's say, say it that way. A season ago, do you expect them to get, you would think year two in a system, you, you would learn maybe a little bit of the nuance of it? Yeah, exactly. I think that that's, that's exactly it. It's the continuity, the understanding you know, because it's Schwartz coming into year two. He knows his chess pieces. He knows how to work them now. Uh, some of it will hinge around, you know, health and stuff with like Mo Hurst because he was obviously injured towards the end of the year. But he was a highly efficient player. And to understand like when to turn that on, when to set him loose, you know, to get that push up the middle, when to spell Zadarius and Miles to keep them fresh. I think that all comes along with it. And just, just just getting better as a group, you know, feeding off each other, just just growing together. I think you're going to see that in year two. Um, let me ask it. So let's ask, we'll ask it two ways. What do you think the most surprising move was, and what move do you like the most so far? Surprising has to go to Jameis Winston. <laughs> I did yeah. not see that coming. Uh, but it's a welcome one for me. It's someone that I was on the uh, All Eyes on Cleveland, Brad, Brad Ward. And I mentioned Jameis, and he kind of gave me a look. And I was like, I'm serious. I, I, I definitely see that's a, a role he could fit here in Cleveland as the backup. Uh, and I know it caught people off guard. He's a high-profile name, former number one overall pick. But he's been relegated to backup duty for a couple years. And I think that this is a system he could do well in. You know, those bigger-type quarterbacks, something Dorsey has a lot of experience with. You know, and people forget how big Jameis actually is. He's got a big arm. He will let it rip. You know, he's a little more volatile. He's a different style of backup quarterback. You know, some guys come in just to steady the ship. He'll rock the boat. This this guy, he'll, 
he'll go for it. He'll let her rip. And with that sometimes comes turnovers, but big plays come with that too. And I think that that's what the Browns were looking for, someone who could come in and not be afraid, you know, afraid of the moment. And Jameis fits that bill. What move do you like the most so far? Oh, Zadarius. Zadarius. I, did, I wasn't sure they would pull it off. I didn't think they would. I didn't know what his market would look like. And, I, and full disclaimer, I expected him to wait. I expected them to offer Zadaria something and then to sit back and see what the market said. But I think it shows he's happy here. He was happy with the situation, the scheme, the way he was utilized, getting to put his hand in the dirt. He's played mostly outside linebacker, rush style, and a 3-4 for the majority of his career. I think he likes that 4-3 defensive end, that wide nine, being able to, to really stay at the line of scrimmage and get after quarterbacks. So I think he was in love with the fit and the players in that locker room. And, and I think he was happy to come back for two years. You know, and so I, that to me, that is, that, that's the one that, that made me the happiest. Yeah, the other thing about that is, um, you mentioned he was used to being an outside. He's got a year of familiarity, and, and you can be sure there are things he is working on relative to his body to kind of make that transition a little bit easier because now he knows what he knows. Yeah, last year, he, you know, he found out, you know, he got traded for, you know, and comes in and now he knows he has a full off season to equip himself to and just the familiarity with the scheme now and and really get after it and and he was someone that everyone in that locker room looked up to you could tell right when they got into to training camp he was the guy people gravitated around he was actually bringing competitions to miles garrett like you know get off the ball faster and he was pushing miles and you know that goes both ways miles is competitive you know, so that just breeds competition, and, and everyone gets better from that, you know. So I just – I'm super excited that they were able to snag him for another two years. And you know what I, I would imagine? You, you, you bring up Miles Garrett. He's probably one of the most happy that you got not only Zadarius back, but Hurst and Shelby Harris to go along with Dalvin Tomlinson because uh, he had a great season, and now it's another year together for those guys. Yeah, he's got to be ecstatic, you know. He's and just the, the amount of resources that the front office is putting defensive line. So Miles sees that. Miles sees that he you know he's not out there by himself. He's got a great supporting cast. You know, they're able to get most of the band back together. The most important parts, you know, and there might be an addition here or there, but I think he's got to have a, an ease to it. Like he's looking at it. You know, he's going into this next season fully stocked, fully loaded, and ready to get after it. What do you think it means, uh, the additions and where they've come from and the positions they've addressed? What do you think it means for the upcoming draft? Best player available. I just they, They've really stocked the cover. They don't really have any glaring holes that need to be addressed for guys who have to step in right away and play a meaningful role. If they can, that's a bonus, but they don't have to have it. So that allows them to – and it probably signifies more that they'll probably trade back just to get assets – but this also puts them in a position to where if someone starts to slide, like a Keon Coleman, if he starts to slide, they're fluid now. They don't have to have all those picks to, to bolster the roster. The roster is kind of solidified, so they can, they can gamble. They can take more risks. You know, they could even go after a position that maybe not looked at as, as important, you know, like, like a linebacker. They might be able to take a swing earlier on a linebacker or a running back that before they would have had to have that slotted for a wide receiver or edge, you know. So I think it just makes them more fluid in the draft. It, it, to my way of thinking, when you when you lose Taki, and, and I know you signed Jordan Hicks, so I get that, um, but you lose Taki Taki, you lose Anthony Walker. I wouldn't be surprised if they pick a linebacker, and I certainly wouldn't be surprised if they pick a running back in the upcoming draft. Those are two areas. Um, they're not like glaring needs, but – you want to make sure you're kind of covered in, in both of those. Yeah, and you always have to have that next group coming up, and you got to supply competition for the guys in the bottom of that room. You can't let anyone get comfortable. You know, that's that's part of competition. So they definitely need to add to those rooms. Running back, it I, I see a few rookies that I'd be ecstatic with, but I don't know if they're guys you're going to be able to count on right away. And if you do, do get a running back, you might need to get someone you can count on sooner rather than later, given the health of Nick Chubb. You know, so I don't know where they'll go. If they'll go with a developmental guy, there's a couple home run hitters in this draft. You know, everyone looks at Jalen Wright out of Tennessee. You know, he's got amazing long speed. Like he's a guy that, that definitely checks a lot of boxes. But there's a kid out of Louisville, Isaac Garendo. You're gonna be able to get him on day three. That kid is a freak athlete, low low tread on the tires. Went to Wisconsin, shared with Taylor shared with Braylon Allen, then went to Louisville. 
and he had over 22 explosive runs last year. He's a guy I think the Browns could be very interested in. All right, let's head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason for the first time today. Listening to the interviews with Ken Dorsey and Kevin Stefanski, I understand, like, you know, the relationship between was bridged between the North Turner offense. I was wondering, because of that influence, were they going to run similar concepts to North, or were they going to run the offense, but more so in a more modern sense? As always, appreciate all the voicemails. Casey, I. I think the offense could be different. How, how different do you think it will look, and and what do you think will be different? And and we're gonna have, we're gonna hear from a guy that covered Ken Dorsey and knows it. And we're gonna also take a look at some some things that um, offenses with Andy Dickerson have done later in this show. But what do you think this offense will look like moving forward? Well, in reference to the color, I think you'll see some explosive elements that were like hallmarks of North Turner's offense. But North Turner's offense is predicated on seven step drops. That's not happening. They're not going to be running much of that. Uh, but just from what we know, you know it's a million-dollar question. What's it going to look like? Well, with Ken Dorsey, we know that there's a ton of RPO game. Uh, the one thing that I look at the most that no one's really talking about is in Dorsey's offenses, there's been a lot of choice routes built in, coverage beaters, so to speak. So if a defense comes out in the cover two, as long as the quarterback and wide receiver see it the same, there's already things like fail safes built in to bail them out of certain situations. So that takes a while to implement. It takes a while for quarterbacks and wide receivers to get on the same page. But after they do, it's almost like a cheat code. So I, I know that'll be in there. Uh, a lot of 12 personnel, a lot of mo- like well, a tight end move situation where you have a guy lined up in the backfield, a tight end, who can motion out and create mismatch problems. Um, but one thing we don't know, we won't know until we actually see it, is how much motion is going to be involved. Because the Browns were low on motion last year, and Dorsey's traditionally been low on motion. But if you look at the way the league's evolving, that is something that is coming into play. You know, you don't know how much input a Tommy Reese is going to have. So that, that's the, the missing element. We know there's going to be shotgun. We know there's going to be a ton of vertical game. That is another hallmark of Dorsey. You know, so we know those things are coming. But what we don't know is the motion. And I think you need to implement that in today's NFL. Yeah, one of the guys, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit later in a couple of segments. So <clears throat> Andy Dickerson has some roots with Sean McVay, and that's, that's a guy that does plenty of motion. So that, that's kind of, we'll connect the dots there. Uh, the other thing is, do you think they play more 11 personnel? I, if, if it's me and I have the opportunity to get Cooper, Elijah Moore, and, um, and, and Jerry Judy on the field, I don't know how many people – the Browns have three cornerbacks that are cover them, can cover them. I don't know how many other teams do. Yeah, yeah, that's something that has to be leaned on heavily. You have skill, differing skill sets, a, a wide receiver, and there's a, a plenty of full speed now with you adding Judy to a long Elijah Moore. And, and even though Cooper's not a blazer, like he doesn't lack speed, you know. He's not the guy that's going to take the top off. But now you have other areas you can do that in. So, yeah, you have to try to create mismatches. And there's an interchangeable uh, feature here with, with Moore and Judy where you can kind of mix and match. And Cooper's actually been historically great in the slot. Doesn't get a ton of opportunities at it because of how valuable he is on the outside. But now you might see a mix and a match. So when they get an 11 personnel, they can keep defenses guessing. Yeah, and the other thing is you, you find the weakest link defensively and you attack it relentlessly. And, and you've got three guys that are – should be tough to match. They're, again, the Browns can match up with it. Their toughest matchup, those wide receivers, are going to be in practice if they keep Greg Newsom. And you've got Ward, Emerson, and Newsom. Not many people can do that. Yeah, the abil- iron sharpens iron. You know, the ability for those guys to go at it, especially in training camps, is going to be something. They're going to come out of that better for it, that's for sure. And even when we talk about these mismatches the wide receivers are creating, you can't forget they have David and Joku. And now you have a third down back in Naheem Hines. Like, they have options. They have ways they can figure out answers. You know what I mean? If defenses want to approach them a certain way, they take something away, they're going to have to give up something. And now the Browns have the skilled players to take advantage of that. Casey Kinnaman, is always great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Casey. Hey, anytime. Thanks for having me. Casey Kinnaman, make sure you check him out. Dog Pound Daily and the Barking Browns podcast. Always really good stuff. We're going to take a quick time out, other side of the break. Lance Reisland joins us, film breakdown, video analysis of Jerry Judy and what his skill set is and what he brings to the Browns. Sports for Sally, we'll be right back. Stay with us. Go ahead and pop a clamp on that. Let's take five. 
With one of these five Lady Luck scratch-offs from the Ohio Lottery, like this new $20 100X with its million dollar grand prize, I want to get my cut of that 76% payout. So, good news. We're playing the largest family of scratch-offs ever. These Lady Lucks have all the fun and no complications. We continue talking Browns on sports for CLE. So as the league year begins, one of the bigger additions for Andrew Barry and the Browns, wide receiver Jerry Judy. Let's take um, a video breakdown film analysis of what Jerry Judy does well. Whenever we do that, we welcome in Lance Risland from the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. Um, Lance, is, is Judy a different type of receiver before we get to some of the clips? Well, you know, for me, he's a complete receiver. He can play inside. He can play outside. He can run the complete route tree. He can run uh, the jet sweeps, the reverses. He can do a lot of different things. I also like the fact um, that he's explosive. So he's a little bit more explosive than Amari Cooper with the flat straight ahead speed. He's also a great route runner. Now, some of his stuff that I, I don't think he's lived up to um, what he can be with the 15th pick in the 2020 draft. He's extremely talented. The way we used to break down our receivers is three phases, you know, first, second, third phase. He's really good at all three phases. I think with the new scenery, having a, a, an elite quarterback, uh, being in a system, being in a, being in a program where the Browns are expected to win and they practice that way, I think is really going to help Jerry Judy. He seems like he needs a change of scenery. He needs a little bit of an attitude adjustment. And, and I think being with the Browns, being with Amari Cooper, Stefanski, I think it's going to be a real uh, good thing for him. Talent-wise, he's an elite guy. And hopefully the Browns can get that out of him. All right. You mentioned the three phases. So the first one, um, and we're, we'll take some look at some clips from each of them. Uh, release and routes. Take us through what you see here. So first thing you're going to get is you're going to get a, uh, he's going to run a slant. And now he's got a sluggo. This is a sluggo. So all you see in his routes is that the first phase is always releases and then the route itself. He does very, very well at both. So. Going back, you're going to see him on a vertical here, but going back to the first route that will be coming up right now is you're going to see him at the top. He's going to run a, a slant. He's going to get that corner to turn his hips. Then you're going to see attention to detail where he's going to snap his head in on a sluggo. Uh, he's got great acceleration in and out of his brakes. He's very he's very slippery when he catches the ball. And he's also got good breakaway speed. He creates great separation from corners. Uh, I like the way he catches the ball in front of him. I like the way he uses his hands. But, again, he's very hard to jam off the line of scrimmage. He's very good in zone. He understands um, – what people are trying to do to him. I think he's got a, you know, this is one of the things, he's a super talented guy. He's got great body control at the end of that catch there. I think he's a guy, once again, once he gets with a, an elite quarterback and in a system where he doesn't have to be the go-to guy, he's going to shine. And I think the Browns are a perfect fit for him. And it's important to note, the quarterback play with the Broncos has been inconsistent. You had Drew Locke, you had um, Russell Wilson last year. Uh, but when we look at the second phase um, that you're talking about, it's the catch point. So take us through the clips and what you see here. Well, two things you're going to see. You're going to see him catches the ball with his hands right there on a the slant. Does a great job. Then you're going to see him here. He high points the ball. So he's very, very good at 50-50 uh, uh, balls. He gets it out in front. He reaches it at the highest point. So both of these um, things kind of lead into our next, which is the ability to run after the catch. But the ability to run after the catch is to first make the catch. He does a great job of using his length. Uh, regardless of what route he runs, to get to get his body in front of the defender, and then he uses his hands to catch the ball out in front of him, which allows him to use that. You know, he's got a pretty good uh, radius, pretty good wingspan. But what he does is that he positions his body so well. He's got great body awareness, great spatial awareness. He understands where he's at on the field. Uh, he's a really talented guy. You know, two years ago he almost got to a thousand yards. Um, he's got 211 catches. He's been solid. He just hasn't been 15th pick in the draft good yet. But I think it's there. He's just got to be in the right system, and I think the Browns might be that system for him. And again, fifth year in the league, the, the Broncos did pick up the fifth-year option that he had since he was um, a first-round pick, 15th overall. All right, phase three, you mentioned the third phase, and you kind of alluded to it, yards after the catch. What do you see with these clips? So you're going to see version just the idea of uh, having run playing game to tag. You can see his acceleration once he catches the ball. He does this all the time. Next, you're going to see just a, uh, a, a high-low. And what you see here is just that acceleration when he catches the ball. And he does this all the time. And these are things that the Browns do. Now, with that ability to catch the ball and run with it, you also get some reverses and jet sweeps and things you can do with him 
uh, you know, in different situations, different formations. Again, the swing pass, just the ability to get upfield, easy yards the Browns have been dying for. Here's a high low. The Browns love to run. He's the high, and then he just accelerates. You can see him running away from defenders with his speed. And then right here, you just get a little reverse. And again, it's a touch guy. So it might be a, a lot, allow Elijah Moore to stay more at the receiver. J Judy can be more in the slot a little bit. He's a little bit bigger at 195 pounds. But again, he's a, a complete receiver, kind of like Elijah Moore. And, and obviously, they can learn from Amari Cooper. But just a guy who can do everything, um, got great skills, physical skills, um, are not are not lacking with Jerry Judy. He just needs to get himself together, not worry about what people say, and, and be focused on the task at hand. And I think being with the Browns' new scenery is going to do that for him. When you um, when you look at his skill set versus Cooper's skill set versus Elijah Moore's skill set, what are they similar at all, or is there any redundancy in that, or do they each bring um, a little different element to the receiving core? Well, I think I think what you get out what you get out what you wanted out of Elijah Moore, you're going to get a little bit more out of Judy because he's a little bit bigger. But then what I what it allows you to do is allow those guys. Cooper's your number one outside guy. The digs come back to the post. Judy gives you a little bit more vertical threat. He can also, like I said, run those jets, the reverses, the gadget plays. Elijah Moore is an elite route runner. Elijah Moore now can work in the slot, but he doesn't have to. He's Elijah Moore's not real heavy, so he allows him just to work in the slot. Uh, the RPO game, the inside option routes, the over unders. The things where you can get him in space, but not necessarily toss it to him because of his size. So Judy and a lot uh, and more have a lot in common in terms of their skill set. Judy's just a little bit bigger, but they're all good enough to run inside, outside. Uh, they run the full route tree from the slot, from the outside. So that gives you a lot of uh, flexibility in your formations and what you want to do. And now you're a lot, you're able to attack. If you think about those three guys, and you got Njoku, and you got, um, you know. Uh, the, the guys in the backfield and Watson coming back and all these guys, they have such a talent, talent rich base now that they can take advantage of it without one guy having to carry the load. And, you know, with Chubb coming back from injury and, and, you know, you know, things like that. I think it's a, he's a perfect fit because now they have, they have another piece to this puzzle that should make him pretty, pretty dominant on offense. When you look at um, having three re receivers like that, does that speak to kind of a, a transition to plan more 11 personnel, so in other words, one tight end, one back, in an effort to maximize Deshaun Watson's abilities. Yeah, so you're all in on Deshaun Watson, right? So I think 11 personnel gives you a lot of bit of a, a ton of flexibility in what you can do, and because these receivers can do different things, you're not stuck in 11 personnel uh, with all, uh, only outside receivers or only inside slot guys. You have guys that can do a bunch of stuff. So if you look at those three with Njoku. Then you can bring Harrison Bryant in if you if he's still with the team because he does a lot of fullback responsibility. I think Jordan Aikens will be better. Uh, hopefully, I'm not sure what's happening with him. The, you know, the backup tight end play has got to improve a little bit. Uh, but when you look at those, Najoku and those three receivers with Chubb in the backfield, Watson, I think 11 personnel becomes their 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 top personnel group. Just simply, uh, it maximizes Deshaun Watson, and you can still run the ball because you still have a tight end in there. And then you focus on that offensive line. And remember, running the ball uh, out of spread sets in the NFL is sometimes easier than running out of those power sets because you get people out of the box. So I think this addition is really, really huge for the Browns. It gives them an ele another electric player uh, that can do something with the ball and get those easy yards that you and I always talk about. It, it also seems like it would open up the field. more. You're going to have – if you've got those three guys on the field – not many, unless you're the Browns, not many teams can match up with three wide receivers with those skill sets. Well, now, and now you're now you're looking at the true run pass option. So now you get you know you get those kill kill plays. So you come up, you get two high safeties, you run the ball down their throat because you have a good offensive line, and that means you got six in the box. If they go seven in the box, that means they got one high hat or, or no high hats, and they're covering these three guys in man coverage, which is going to be a problem as well. Then if you're in man coverage, not only is it hard to cover, but now Deshaun Watson can beat you with his feet. The, the recipe is there. Obviously, they have to get, they have to be able to prove it and do it on the field. Uh, you started to see that a little bit. You know, Deshaun was having a lot of success before his injury, uh, kind of turning the corner a little bit. You felt like, but yeah, now you get these true looks where if you're going to play run, they're going to pass. If you're going to play pass, they're going to run, and they have the talent to do it. Uh, with that defense, uh, expectations will be very high, and they should be. 
Lance Roslin, as always, great stuff. Uh, stick around. We're going to bring you back in uh, a little bit later in the show to talk about five players in the draft um, that might fit what the Browns offense is going to look like coming up here. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out, other side of the break. Um, we'll take a look at some motion and what the Browns offense under uh, Andy Dickerson will be. Uh, Lance Risen will break that down in just a minute. Sports for CLE will be right back. We're talking Browns and what the offense looks like with the new coaching staff. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. We continue talking Browns here on Sports for CLE. Uh, plenty of changes to the offensive coaching staff um, of the Browns. Ken Dorsey, the new offensive coordinator. Andy Dickerson, the new offensive line coach. You also have Deuce Staley, running backs coach. Tommy Reese, tight ends coach. So uh, plenty of new ideas. Um, what does it all mean? It means the Browns are probably trying to get more pre-snap motion. These are the top teams, uh, Dolphins with Mike McDaniel, Rams with Sean McVay, significantly more pre-snap motion um, than everybody else in the league, really. 49ers were third, Packers were fourth, Super Bowl champs, the Chiefs were 16th, so middle of pack with 19%. Browns were second last. Only the Philadelphia Eagles had fewer uh, fewer percentages, so less pre-snap motion in their plays last year than the Browns did. Kevin Stefanski at the NFL Scouting Combine was asked, is it by design? Why was there so little pre-snap motion in the Browns offense? I hesitate to look in too much to last year uh, in that regard. I think motion, you know, speaking of conflict, I think it's it can make life really hard on the defense. I speak from uh, experience when that picture is changing pre-play, it can make it really a challenge. You can uh, put your receivers in, in advantageous positions via motion. I think what Coach McDaniel did in Miami was really uh, – that those were new things that are, that are now you're going to see that throughout the league uh, but there's certainly elements to it I think what we talk about a lot is you want to mo shift and motion with a purpose you don't want to do it just to do it but if there are opportunities to create uh, advantageous looks for you you certainly want to do it Kevin Stefanski talking about Browns offense and pre-snap motion so the Browns hired Andy Dickerson as their new offensive line coach to replace Bill Callahan Dickerson was the offensive line coach for the Seattle Seahawks. Before that, though, he worked for Sean McVay with the Rams, so he does have some of a history um, in, in coaching staffs that use pre-snap motion. Let's welcome in Lance Reislin uh, from the Plain Dealer, as well as Cleveland.com. Some uh, video analysis, film breakdown of what Dickerson could mean to this Browns offense. Um, and Lance, you, you looked at the places he's been and the offenses that um, he has been an offensive line coach for. What do, you, what do you see with Dickerson? Well, I think he's really good, and I think he's got one of the toughest jobs, toughest replacement jobs in the NFL. Uh, Callahan, uh, I, like I said before, I, I had the opportunity to watch him down there for 25, 30 minutes each day uh, over the course of two camps, and he's just so incredibly dynamic in how he does things. Uh, I think Dickerson's a really good fit because not only is he a connection to what Stefanski and Dorsey and, and Tommy Reese like to do with the two tight end sets and things like that, but he's also a, a connection to the new, the McVay, with the movement in the condensed formations. Uh, he was with McVay for a long time with the Rams. He was the uh, o, uh, o, a run coordinator in Seattle in 21. Then he was the old line coach in Seattle for 22, 23. Uh, they did a lot of similar stuff, but he also brings in some different stuff for McVay. So I think he's a fantastic hire. Uh, I love uh, the similarities in physicality of what Callahan kind of caught here with the, uh, taught here with the Browns. So I think I think Cleveland's in good shape with this young guy. All right, let's take a look at the first clip. And, and you said this is kind of how he fits into that scheme that the Browns like. So this is our uh, first clip here. So you're going to get his own play. Uh, Browns like to do this. So if you look at when the play goes back here, you're going to see the Browns. Uh, this is 13 personnel. 
and Seattle's going to overload the right side, which makes the Texans over, overload their defensive left side. Uh, it's just a real easy double team the inside zone, outside zone look here. Uh, they're going to get a double team up to the uh, number one linebacker. Uh, there's no one left, and Browns run this a ton where they're going to overload one side with the tight ends and run backside either with the counter or with uh, zone. Now, the key, the key for Dickerson, what I was looking at, it's not really the scheme, right? So in every scheme, you're either going to double team, a down block, a reach, uh, a mic block. There's certain things within every scheme that are the same, and one of the things that he does really well is his guys double team really well, and that's what the Browns have done really well over the last couple years with Callahan is double team and gets to the next level, and his guys in Seattle and his guys – uh, and L.A. did a fantastic job of that. So this is just the zone with the front side double, and they get to that number one linebacker in the box. All right, so um, another clip that we're going to look at is some similarities. Uh, take us through this next one, what you like here. And this, again, is something that the Browns do with Stefanski and Dorsey. So, again, if you watch the play as it starts over here a couple times, you're, you're going to see the left side of the line just cave in the right side of the line here, and you're going to see the big movement. Then you're going to see the backside tight end come across – it's called a split zone, and, and this is just like the zone read, uh, but instead of reading that backside end, you're just blocking him. So again, even though it's split zone, zone from the previous play, it's big double teams at the point of attack. And you can see uh, Seattle's a very physical bunch. They, uh, just like the Browns, are inside. Uh, this is the way they're coached. It's not on accident. So, uh, you know, when you're with Pete Carroll, Carroll, he's always like a powerful running game. So this fits in very well for what the Browns like to do. And again, I like the idea of, of split zone here. Because there's times we don't, you know, the Browns are not going to want Deshaun Watson to run the ball very much. He, I don't know if he can take that pounding uh, at this stage of his career. So they're going to want to make sure that he has some direct handoffs. Again, big double teams. You can see the movement. Browns do this very well. Uh, and Dickerson will get the Browns going with this uh, same scheme. All right. We're going to take a look at one more that is uh, similar. Um, this, this is another thing that the Browns do some of. Take us through this and, and what you like here. So now you get a gap scheme. So, uh, again, right, so it's zone or if it's gap, you're still getting a big front side double team on the three technique. Now you're going to get the left guard and the left tackle going to pull around. The left guard's going to kick out the defensive end. The left tackle, number 76, is going to wrap up in the hole. This is a classic guard counter. Now the Browns run it a bunch of different ways. They run it with the guard and the tackle. They run it with the guard and the H-back. They run it with the guard and a receiver. They run it with a bunch of different people. But basically what it is is you're blocking down. You're kicking out and you're up through. And the Browns do this very, very well. Uh, again, a, a concept that translates very well to what the Browns have been running. Uh, so has Dickerson. So uh, two things that carry over very, very well. All right. So those are the concepts that the Browns currently run. We've also mentioned he, he was with Sean McVay in that offense for a little bit. So these are some things that the, uh, the Browns could incorporate um, that Dickerson uh, was doing with McVay's offense. Take us through this first and what you see here. So what you get out of this, this with this McVay, Shanahan, uh, McDaniel, you get a bunch of, it's still the same stuff. So it's still a zone concept here. A little bit, I think it's more of a gap concept because of the backfield action, the quarterback and the running back opening to their left, which is trying to create flow with the uh, defense. But what you get is you get the backside receiver coming across. And, and again, now they're using receiver as a kickout guy. And they're going to use them from the line of scrimmage. It's not motion. It's that they just use the speed to come all the way across. So a little innovative way to get the receivers blocked in the run game. And I was asked yesterday, how, do, how would you define um, what McVay does? And, and what I think he does really well is that it's the same runs everybody else runs, but he runs them from condensed formations and they run a lot of different motions, and they have different guys than normal uh, blocking with blocking rules. So you're going to get receivers now. They're going to have tight end and lineman blocking rules, which in space can work, and, and they've proven that it works. So they create an unbalanced line here. They get a big push, and they get the receiver coming around. Um, you can see the Browns using this with some of their big receivers, Seth Tillman and those guys. Yeah, the, the other thing that that – speaks to is you can't if you run it with wide receiver personnel they don't get big on the defensive side of the ball so you spread them out you keep it small and if you have physical wide receivers like the Browns have advantage uh, advantage Browns offense all right take us through this next uh, this next clip what you see here so very, very cool concept here again so what, what you're getting here is it's just a zone so if you look at what uh, as, you, as the play goes over and over here you're just gonna see hard motion by woods in motion what that does um, it's just eye candy. So what they're trying to do is he's trying to get the, the, the attention of a uh, second level. And you're going to see 
Uh, the linebackers flow with motion, and they end up getting caught in these big double teams by the Rams. So you're going to see big double teams. You're going to see great movement. Um, rarely are you going to see the Rams, and, and I think the Browns will start to incorporate more and more of this, is there's always going to be movement, whether the movement is going to be eye candy where it doesn't have any responsibility, or as we watched on the last play where they have a lot of responsibility. But constant movement creates constant eye contact. And that eye candy makes it really, really tough for a defender to find the football. So uh, lots of movement. I see movement, movement, movement from the Browns offense moving forward with Dickerson here. And, and again, that's one of the things that we had talked about. That's one of the trends. The, the higher scoring offenses incorporate the most pre-snap motion um, in the NFL. We've talked about that repeatedly. All right, take us through this next clip. What you see here, what's going on? This is really this is a cool one. So now you get uh, you know the McVay's uh, films are very very fun to watch. Guys, sometimes remember I'm I'm breaking it down because the coach is just a joy to watch. So they're going to start off with a, a formation left strength here left, and they're going to put Cooper Cup in motion, and they're going to bring the other receiver number twelve in motion, and they're going to bring him around. It's almost like a pooling guard. So again, you're going to get these big double teams on the right side blocking these guys down, and then instead of bringing uh, you know, a, a guard and a tackle or a guard and a tight end, they're bringing two receivers. And you see Cup gets it in there first, and then here comes the receiver. So, again, it gives you the ability to get unbalanced. You can create formation strength one way and come back the other way with motion and bringing those guys across. Just a really creative way to run the same play, same double team kind of concept, zone, uh, gap schemes, all the stuff that the Browns run. But now you're just getting to it a little different way uh, with receivers out in front. And uh, he does this very, and I see this is something, um, this is from 220. So I see this being a part of what the Browns do. Th this is Dickerson when he's with McVay in, in 220. Yeah, and again, that's, that's a strength of Kevin Stefanski's offense is that formation flexibility. All right, um, take us through this next clip and what you see here. Well, here, you know, so now you get, now you just get a jet sweep. So now, um, you know, I've been asked why the Browns, when the Browns run jet sweep, why wasn't it successful? Well, um, it's the same reason that, that when I when I was coaching, mine wasn't successful until I started running motion all the time. So when you run jet sweep like the Browns have done with uh, Elijah Moore, basically he was going in motion and the play was to him. And then as you saw as the year went along, they started doing motion where the play wasn't going to him. So the more that the Browns motion, and they motion on every play. So every single play the Rams run, Pretty much Cup is going in motion or Woods is going in motion. And they're going in late, fast motion. And this is just, again, this is just zone blocking up front for the linemen. So the linemen only hear zone right, but now it's a jet sweep. It's a fly sweep to, uh, uh, to uh, Woods around the end. And again, it just creates great conflict for a defense. Now they have to prepare to get to the edge as well. Uh, Chubb gets back to health. Uh, Elijah Moore is a guy who can do this. And I think it's a... Dickerson, again, brings this great element of running with the Browns run, but how to window dress a little bit more and how to create more advantages for the offensive line and for receivers and blocking. And this is one of the ways you do it. They're just blocking zone up front, get to the edge with the fast guy. Do you expect the Browns to incorporate more motion? We've talked about it uh, pretty much at length. Um, top six teams that had uh, the most motion were some of the top six offenses. Browns and Eagles were the bottom two. Do you expect that to, to kind of get ratcheted up relative to motion? Well, I do. And, you know, I've always said there's two different ways to look at it. So Kevin is so good at multiple formations with multiple personnel groups. And he'll do shifts and motions and things like that. But once again, I've always said this too. Stefanski is a really, really good football coach. You know, coach of the year kind of guy. Year in and year out. And he's proven that he can do different things with different people. So this is a copycat league, and I said it last week. Football is a game of people have good ideas, and people are inventive and innovative in what they do. And what McVay and McDaniel and Shanahan have done has, has shown to be successful. So, yes, I do think with the addition of Dickerson, and I think, like I said, I think Dickerson's a perfect match because they're still going to rely on the run game. It's still a downhill, physical, um, double-team, uh, in-your-face, Nick Chubb running the ball 15 to 18 to 20 times a game. Now you can add some things to it, some window dressing to it. Maybe get some more people out of the box so you don't have to block as many people. Maybe get some jet sweeps going. Maybe create some advantages in spacing in the pass game. So, yes, I do expect the Browns, because it's a copycat league, to, to run more motion, especially because the league has had such success with it. So I think it's a matter of Kevin saying, you know, he's been really successful with what he does. 
But as coaches, we are always looking to add and add within our system. And this motion stuff doesn't change the system. It just gives you advantages and leverage and numbers game. Lance Roslin with some really good film analysis video breakdown, as always. Check him out, uh, PlainDealerCleveland.com. Always gives you some really good insight. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. We continue to take a look at this remade offensive coaching staff. Vic Carucci from Buffalo gives us uh, some information about Ken Dorsey, the new offensive coordinator. That's straight ahead on Sports for CLE. Stay with us. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program is dedicated to recognizing exceptional students, teachers, and schools throughout Ohio. Scan the QR code on screen to nominate students and teachers as academic all-stars and teachers of the month. They must be currently enrolled or teach in grades K-12. through Is your K-12 through school developing students' literacy skills to achieve success in reading? If so, you can nominate your school for the School of the Year. Students can win $100, teachers can win $500, and schools can win $2,500. Scan the QR code, fill out the forms, and nominate deserving students, teachers, and schools today. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program takes pride in honoring exceptional students, teachers, and schools across Ohio. Submit your nomination today. It's fun, fast, and free. Sports for CLE continues as we continue to look at the Browns' remade offensive coaching staff. And uh, we are pleased to be joined by Vic Carucci. Um, he works in Buffalo, WGRZ TV, also Sirius XM, the NFL channel, uh, XM Radio. Um, Vic, you have covered the NFL for a long time. You've covered the Bills. Um, Ken Dorsey, what does he bring to the Browns offense, do you think? Yeah, I think he brings uh, certainly a lot of quarterback-centric experience, not only as a former player at the position, but coaching the position. And the immediate thing, any quarterback working with him, now Deshaun Watson and the other QBs in that room, are going to discover is that he has an ability to connect with them at levels that I think other coaches who haven't played or don't have the vast experience of coaching the position uh, will lack. Now, Josh Allen is a guy that developed under Ken Dorsey. Mm -hmm. um, you hear Josh Allen talk glowingly about Ken Dorsey. How much did Ken Dorsey, you know, help Josh Allen develop into the quarterback he is? There, there is no question that Ken helped unlock a lot of what you see from Allen. Remember, Allen was a, a really raw prospect when he came from Wisconsin to the Bills. And a, a, as a rookie, uh, you could see all those rough spots, but you could also see how he was trending in the right direction. I'm not going to say it was all because of Ken Dorsey, but if you ask Josh Allen, it had a lot to do with Dorsey's ability to recognize uh, the elements of his game that needed honing and, and, and working on in the c combining. And, and he didn't do this in college, but he became much more of a runner slash thrower as a pro than he was in college. And again, that's Dorsey uh, seeing that in him, ha having seen the same thing when he worked with Cam Newton in Carolina. Yeah, you mentioned it. So there's a, a history with quarterbacks that are mobile. Now, it, they're not the same. I mean, we're not right. sitting here saying that Cam Newton and Ken uh, and uh, Josh yeah. Allen are the same as Deshaun Watson. But he has a history of finding ways to maximize guys like that. Yeah, and, and it's I think it's it's tapping into what they trust uh, and and what they're comfortable with. I, I think the the worst thing we know coaches can do is forcing a player to do something because that's what the coach understands. And even if the player gets it through the coaching that he receives, if it's not something that's in his DNA or, or his comfort level, uh, it's it's usually not going to work out well. That's a that's kind of obvious. But in terms of Josh Allen, um, the fact that if you want to measure how much faith he had in Ken's ability to get the best out of him. When Ken was fired from the job in Buffalo, which which happens midway through last season, um, Josh was crushed. This was a guy that he pushed for to become the coordinator the previous year in 2022, um, wanting him very badly after Brian Dayball left to become head coach of the Giants, wanting 
uh, uh, Ken Dorsey very badly to get the job, felt he deserved it, and they, they developed as much of a friendship, a kinship as a coach-player relationship, and I feel like that's a natural way Ken operates. So you mentioned um, things didn't go well midway through the year. The, the Bills were underachieving as a team. Dorsey gets pushed out. Is that as simple as it was? It just wasn't the right fit? Well, look, I, I mean, coaching changes happen, and we know um, for a variety of reasons. When they happen at midseason, when it's not the head coach being fired and his staff being cleaned out, okay, you take a second look at it. Uh, I, I second-guessed it along with a lot of other people who said, is this really the right solution for the Bills to be doing this? Uh, they were going through a skid, but at the time that that move happened, right after a Monday night loss against the Denver Broncos, a real upset, that you said, gee, is, is, is he a scapegoat uh, guy? That was questioned. Now, with Joe Brady uh, taking over from quarterbacks coach being promoted to coordinator, d did things ultimately work out well? Yes. And, and they get the number two seed in the playoffs, uh, and, and things did move in the right direction. That said, I, I don't think it diminished Ken Dorsey's skill level, and the fact that he was, that he was able to find another job uh, told me that, okay, around the league, there's a respect level that this guy has. And I think the fit is good when you when you look at the, the skills that Deshaun Watson has as a not just thrower and then runner in separate compartments, but thrower throwing and running at the same time. These are the things that I think Ken Dorsey can design from a play standpoint, a, a, a game plan, uh, excuse me, playbook standpoint, and then a game plan play calling standpoint dialing up those right calls and that's where uh, going back to Josh Allen's comfort level that's what Josh always I think appreciated is that when he had that voice in his ear from Dorsey he was hearing the things that clicked with him so you're also very familiar with the Browns you, you wrote um, you worked for the Browns yes. for a number of years how do you think he fits with with what you know of Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski and that coaching staff yeah I, I think the coaching staff uh, is the right fit for him. I, I have such high regard for Kevin Stefanski and what he can do with an offense and, and with a quarterback. Uh, and for Kevin to identify Dorsey as the right fit for that staff and for Deshaun uh, tells me a lot because, uh, again, my, I wouldn't, I, I'd, I'd hesitate to really second guess uh, Kevin, when it when it comes to pushing those right buttons, I know uh, I know Alex Van. I still know Alex Van Pelt quite well from his time as a quarterback with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, followed him all the way through his coaching time. Um, so he, when Kevin felt a change had to be made there, fine. But okay, what's it's 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 easy to always say get rid of a guy, but what's the next step? And getting uh, Dorsey to me um, is is. I don't know, I wouldn't necessarily even say it's an upgrade, but I don't think it puts them in any kind of hole because it, it follows a line of two very quarterback smart people from Van Pelt to Dorsey. The other thing that, you know, when we were talking beforehand, um, Kevin Stefanski designs the runs, so mm -hmm. that, that kind of marries with what maybe Dorsey is learning. Yes, it, and, and I would say if there's any question, it is going to be that, um, the balance. And, and I think if, if you asked Sean McDermott if, if he's being, you know, totally honest about what made him, what was the, 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 the thing that pulled the trigger on, on making the change, it'll come back to the, the, the need for more balance, the involvement, incorporation of more running game. And you did see that. James Cook certainly came on strong in the second half of the season. There was more balance to the offense, and I think it worked out uh, much better for, for uh for Josh Allen and the offense. So I think if there's a lesson that Ken Dorsey learned from a failed experience in Buffalo, it'll be that. And and why not, in terms of running the football more, look at the team you've got, look at the offensive line that's there. It, that should be a natural idea. It, it's, it seems like you think the Dorsey fit in this offense with Deshaun Watson is pretty good. I, I do. Well, first of all, it, we are talking about Deshaun Watson and the talent level that's there. Um, we, we, you know, there, there can be any number of questions that you want to raise about what his body of work, what his career has been uh, to this point. Um, but, you know, I, I, and, and to finally see him, and, and this, is, this is it, like, are we at a point now where when is when, is, when, is when? like, does he go over the top with it 
performance-wise and success-wise this year. I, in my mind, you, 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 if you see another year go by that it's considered a wasted year with Deshaun Watson, that's a problem for the Browns. So um, I, making this move with Dorsey tells me, okay, we're going to throw as much as we can as an organization at the resource, you know, as many resources as we can to get the most out of this guy who is their future or not. We're going to find out. As always, appreciate it. Vic My Carucci, pleasure. great stuff. Okay. Uh, Vic Carucci from Sirius XM Radio, uh, the NFL channel on Sirius XM, as well as WGRZ in Buffalo, giving us the insight on Ken Dorsey. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. We continue taking a look at how the Browns remade this offensive coaching staff on Sports for CLE. Stay with us. Here comes the rush. All right, everybody, let's take five. With one of these five Lady Luck scratch-offs from the Ohio Lottery. Like the $10 Lady Luck 50X. It's got prizes all the way up to 500 grand, so you can really clean up. The Lady Luck family of scratch-offs is the Ohio Lottery's first ever, with five price points from $1 to $20. they are an easy way to cook up some fun. Roster building season well underway in the NFL with the beginning of the new league year. Uh, we've told you about some of the guys the Browns uh, have already inked. Time to look at some guys they might be adding in the NFL draft. Film breakdown, video analysis. Whenever we do that, we welcome in Lance Reislin from The Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. So, um, Lance, these are five guys that um, could impact the Browns offense this year and why you think they could and you start out with a running back Isaac Garendo um, six foot 221 pounds from Louisville what do you like about him well you're going to see this thing he's, he's extremely big fast and powerful so you're going to see uh, inside inside run here uh, his ability to break tackles like you said he's 6'1 he's 221 uh, he just killed the combine so physically he's gifted he ran a 4 3 3 40 a uh, 4.15 shuttle uh, he had a 41 inch 41 0.5 inch vertical leap and 129 inch broad jump. So athletically, he's elite. He's fluid. Uh, he's sudden. He's twitchy. Uh, he's especially good on zone concepts. So he doesn't have a lot of shake in him where he's going to shake and bake, but he puts that foot in the ground and he gets vertical really fast. I really like Blake Corum from Michigan. I really like Braylon Allen from Wisconsin. I think those guys would be a good fit too. The reason I like this guy so much is because of his breakaway speed. And I think the Browns are always looking with Deshaun Watson with breakaway speed. The other thing I really like about this guy is he's really good in pass protection. And if you're going to play uh, be a three down back in the NFL, especially with Deshaun Watson as your quarterback, you have to be able to pass protect. And I think his size and his strength give him the ability to pass protect. I wouldn't be shocked if they went with another guy here. Obviously, the signing of Judy now kind of allows the, the staff, they're not really weak anywhere. And now they can find guys with the best value. And I think Garendo is a guy who come in be a third down guy initially and, and his size allows him to get the Browns at least second four which is you know second six or second between four and six which is what they got to have so I just like this guy's home run ability uh, I also like the fact that he's only got 231 career carries so there's a lot of tread left on that on those tires yeah I did see that and, and always important because you know um, running backs take a pounding, especially in the NFL. All right, the second guy we're going to take a look at, wide receiver, uh, kind of a little bit of a bigger target, Xavier Leggett, 6'1", 223 pounds, South Carolina. What do you like with him? So you're going to see him here. I like his physical gifts, right? So he's a big physical, big physical kid who can really run. Um, 71 receptions last year. He runs a 4'3", 40. Uh, he's a really solid vertical threat. What I like about these next two guys, him and Malachi Corley out of West, uh, Western Kentucky, is the, their, their size. So they're over 200 pounds. So they, if the Browns are with Dickerson are going to go to this condensed formation with a little bit more motion, these kind of guys can not only motion, but they can play tight in those condensed formations, and they can block safeties and linebackers because they're a little bit bigger. So they can run the motion. They can also block. They can do a lot of different things. The thing I like about Leggett, his number one quality for me is his ability to make contested catches. So again, a guy who, with the signing of Judy, doesn't have to be uh, a star. He could be that fourth receiver and kind of be a red zone threat with that size. He can also be a gadget guy. He can be a guy who blocks. He could be a guy who runs the verses. So they're going to need some depth. You always need depth in the NFL. 
these next two guys kind of fit the same bill where they can run after they catch. They got that Debo Samuel in them where they can play on the backfield if necessary. They can block just big, big physical guys who just need touches. And Leggett's a really physical guy, big guy, and I think would be really, really good uh, in the red zone for the Browns early. Yeah, you mentioned um, really important against press man. That's obviously important. And the other thing is, is the other note I saw, he has to improve his route tree. And that's those are things that aren't necessarily um, uncommon in rookie wide receivers. Yeah, you know, and they got to be able to, you can't teach the physical stuff, right? You can't teach the size and speed, but you can break down those details. And remember, when you're in college, going from high school to college or college to the pro, you're, if you're at that level, you're better than everybody else. So you're able to get away with not being uh, always fundamentally sound because you're just physically better than the per a person across from you. When you get to the NFL, then all of a sudden you have to, you know, if you, I, I use Alex Wright as an example for the Browns defense. His first year, he really struggled because he didn't use his hands very well. Last year, he had a lot of success because he started to use his hands, but he couldn't do that unless he was 6'5", 280. And that's, you know, you can't teach the physical skills. You can teach the footwork. You can teach some of the routes. You can teach those things, but you got to be big and fast. And that's what Leggett is. That's what Corley is. So there's some guys that, you know, those guys need to be able to make plays, but um, they don't have to be stars right away. They just got to come in and, and do what they do best, which is be pretty versatile and, and give uh, Stefanski another weapon. So you mentioned Malachi Corley, um, Western Kentucky, 5'10", 215. This is the guy that uh, draws comparisons to Debo Samuel. So, you know, it did be like uh, a guy I do some draft guy, uh, special with. We always have our uh, favorites each year, and this guy uh, is one of my favorites. Um, I really like him. He's, you know, he's self-proclaimed uh, a yak guy, yards after catch. What I like about him is his lower body strength. So his ability, he can do things like screens. But you're going to see what I really like on this run right here is that he's going to get hit right in thighs, and he gets hit right in thighs and doesn't move and then breaks the tackle for a touchdown. Uh, then you're going to see him on this screen, this tunnel screen. Again, his ability to get in space. Um, it break tackles. He's very sudden. He's very twitchy. Again, you could toss him the ball out of the backfield on jet sweeps, um, regular sweeps. This is just an under route, um, little mesh concept from Western Kentucky. A guy who's really good with the ball in his hands. Now, I think with the Browns, because the Browns have a fairly, fair, pretty elite roster, now you're talking about a guy who can punt return, maybe a guy who can kick return. They need to improve the little things now. The Browns have got a pretty elite roster. They have to be better on the return games. They have to be better at covering kicks. They have to do everything right if they plan uh, on making a Super Bowl run. This is a guy who can improve a lot of things. And a guy, once again, just come in and be a touch guy. A guy who gets five to seven touches a game and, and a guy who can break it because he'll be fresh. Love this guy's film. Uh, uh, sudden, twitchy, electric. Uh, one of my favorite, fil fam uh, favorite film breakdowns of the year so far. All right. Um, the next uh, guy that we're going to look at, a, a big guy, 6'6". Uh, six, six, 253 pounds, Jared Wiley from Texas Christian. Um, guy that now is a tight end, was a wide receiver. What do you see with him? Well, you know, I think the Browns need to improve. I think they, the, you know, I do think uh, uh, Bryant and Aikens, I think those guys are south. They didn't have very good years uh, catching the ball last year. Bryant does a lot of things uh, being a fullback. What I like about Wiley is he's, he's a very versatile guy. So he gives you... Uh, a little bit more of an athlete, a guy who physically stretched the field, another red zone guy. So if you do go 12 personnel, now you have two really athletic tight ends in there with the Joku and Wiley. This guy is really athletic. Again, he's a guy who can line up at the fullback. You can do some different things with him. You can line him up. It, like the Joku, he's a tough matchup for a linebacker with his speed and with the DB because of his height and his length. So I think this guy's got a really good upside. I like the offense he was in. Uh, TCU, and this is just a vertical concept. You're going to see he has great ball skills. He's got great spatial awareness, body control, uh, really an athletic guy who can do a lot of different things. And I think is a guy who will be around early day three that the Browns might go for, depending on what their plans are with Aikens and Bryant. But this is an upgrade in terms of athleticism. This is a really athletic kid who could give the Browns uh, a lot of, if they go 12 personnel, this could be a pretty dynamic 12 personnel guy. All right, so uh, you see the tight end there, and um, one more. We're going to take a look at an offensive <coughs> lineman, and he's a big one. Patrick Paul, 6'8", 331 pounds from Houston. What do you see with Paul? Well, you're going to see his length is outstanding. So the Browns have had a ton of success with uh, with Juan Jones and his length. So you're going to see in the first play, he's going to he's at the left tackle, and he's just uses that length to torque that guy down the ground. And then in pass protection, he just uses that massive length. If you look at Dewan Jones, 
Uh, you know, when I watched Juwan Jones at camp, he's really technically sound, but really what he is, he's a really good athlete and he can be taught things. And that's exactly what Paul is. He's a guy, so the Browns, the reason I, I like this guy is a guy who can make an impact. The Browns have to figure out, first of all, what are they doing with Jed Wills? Is he their left tackle of the future? I'm a big Jed Wills fan, but he, um, he has not lived up to what they thought he was going to be, but he has potential. Is Conklin going to stay, you know, where is he at in his career? Super tough guy, really, really good player. But at some point in time, they're going to have to upgrade with some young talent. And this is a guy you probably get on day three who is so massive and so long. Um, not, and then you bump, you know, my thought is you bump the Juan Jones over to the left tackle. Now you have these massive bookend tackles with those really good guys inside. Uh, there's some guards they might like. This is a guy athletically that fits the bill and what they like to do offensively. Uh, they're going to run a little bit more tackle trap this year. Dickinson um, is still going to run that zone, still has to pass protect for Watson. So this is an athletic guy uh, who's the longest guy in the draft, 86 inches uh, in his reach. So he's the longest guy in the draft. Just a guy who I think would make sense, even if he's a transition guy where he's not a starter because he doesn't have to be, but he can just learn from those guys and get better and better. But I think this guy is an absolute stud and a steal uh, on day three if he lasts that long. So a good look at five guys that could fit into the Browns offense for the upcoming season. Uh, Lance Roslin, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Lance. As always, thanks for having me. Lance Roslin, always uh, really good film breakdown and video analysis. Uh, was uh, in the show quite a bit today. Uh, that's going to do it for this edition of Sports for CLE. We will see you back here tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Uh, talking a lot more about draft eligible players. Uh, Trevor Sycamore will join us. Lance will be back with a couple of looks at some more wide receivers. Tomorrow at 4 on Sports for CLE. Have a great night, everybody. See you tomorrow at 4. Thank you.